Fancies. 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 That's, that's, that's actually yes, definitely fancies. We'll start with definitions. Pardon? Let's start with definitions. Oh, we'll be we'll that. That's bad as well. Um, French fancies. Be specific about the fancies. Um, but I don't really know what to say about my business. I'm starting up. Uh, I'm renovating the kitchen here, as you may have seen, which is why you can't actually go in because it's filled with paint. Um, which isn't good for making cakes, but anyway. Uh, so, renovating the kitchen, and uh, hopefully it'll be open in about a month. Uh, then you'll be able to place orders if you want, or come along and try one of the baked goods, or anything like that. But um, other than that, I don't really have anything to say about my business. But I will talk about baking, because baking is one of my favorite passions. It is the best thing that I have ever discovered. I've been baking since I was let's say six, uh, and it was Harry Potter cookies. I don't know if those were out then, but those were the first things I made with my aunt. And they were fantastically bad. Um, <laughs> so after that, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll make some more things. And then whenever I was 10, I got a big plastic bowl and said, I'm going to make a cake. And I thought the cake was just flour and water. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> but then I found out the recipe and I started making cakes and then I made more and more and more and then I stopped and then my girlfriend said to me, oh why, why don't you start making more cakes? So I did and I made lots and too much um, and I've been classified the feeder in their house now. <laughs> but um, so my, my well one of my favourite things that has been said about baking was by the Harry Bikers, and they said, Baking is like being a wizard. You have all these things in front of you that don't look like what you want. You have your flour, eggs, all that, new tallies. Uh, you mix them all together in your big pot, and you put on the heat, and then out comes a lovely crumbly bread or a fluffy cake, and it's delicious. And you say, Where, How did this mess turn into this delicious thing? I just had. Um, so I decided to take that, my favourite passion, and turn it into a business because all of my friends always said, oh, your, your biscuits are so good, make me more. And I said, no, because it's too expensive. <laughs> then I thought, why can't it be expensive for them instead of me? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So yes, Andy Standies will be opening and there will be delicious cakes for all who pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me think, what else can I say? French fancies. Yes, that's everyone has commented on the seller of fancies. And they've said, oh, what, what's a fancy? It's, it's a French fancy and they're quite nice. You should come and try one. One fifty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two! <laughs> two! <laughs> but yes, uh, hopefully in the future what I, what I would really love would be to have a bakery with cafe at the front that I could come to every day and bake and make people happy because that is what I really love about baking. I have three and a half minutes left, oh dear. What's um, your favourite thing to bake? Oh no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, food? <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, the easiest thing to make is probably buns. They take 15 minutes in the oven, 100 grams of flour, eggs, butter, sugar, well, not egg, one egg, um, for 
one serving of buns, which makes 12 buns. You can throw in whatever you want. Chocolate chips, banana, nuts, I don't know, her if you want to. <laughs> um, and you just stick them in some bun cases, throw them in the oven, 15 minutes later you've got lovely buns. But that's the easiest thing to make. But I really don't know what my favourite thing to make is. Probably a cake, because it's the same recipe and you just multiply it by how many servings you want. Cut it in half, jam and cream in the middle, icing on top, it's lovely. Um, I learned recently how to make uh, icing that you get on cakes. I can't even remember the name of it now. Fondant icing. <laughs> learned how to make fondant icing recently. Um, turned out well for the first try. That's that's another thing about baking. Doesn't matter how it looks. Well, to you, whenever you're practicing. As long as it tastes nice, you can eat it, and there's no evidence that it ever existed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, just, you just you keep practicing, and the only evidence is the weight that you keep getting in all these failed experiments. Um, or the, the weight that your friends keep getting, because you go, oh, try this, it's lovely. <laughs> but, it's, but it's really something that you didn't like. So you didn't <laughs> <laughs> I'm never taking a freebie on you. <laughs> <laughs> you won't complain. <laughs> um, Do you make fun of Dyson? <laughs> I didn't believe it whenever I, I made it. It's a kilogram of icing sugar <laughs> to two tablespoons of water. <laughs> and I looked at it and said, No, there's no way that this that there's there's uh, glucose syrup in there as well, but that just makes the water thicker, which means you can leave it even less. But then whenever I started putting in, I was like, "How is this working?" <laughs> <laughs> and then there wasn't enough icing sugar in it, so it was really like a kilogram and two hundred extra grams to make a ball of fondant icing. And I still don't believe that that was real icing sugar that I used. Um, but yes, all you need to start baking is a big bowl and a wooden spoon and well and a cake tin. tin. A ca well, you need a cake tin to put put it in. You can't just put it in the oven. <laughs> 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 you'll have a mess. <laughs> well, you'll have a messy oven um, <laughs> or a melted bowl. <laughs> Unless you make it in Pyrex, don't. Mm, mm, there's a thought. Um, <laughs> but yes, so yeah, he he has to deal with all this now. Yeah. Per soul. Um, but yeah, so all you need is a bowl, a wooden spoon, and a cake tin, and then get the ingredients, and you can make a lovely new cake. And you can get ice, and you, you can do whatever you want with bacon. It is such a wide range of things you can do. And bacon doesn't even have to be cakes. You can make anything that goes in the oven is bacon. So a chicken roast is bacon. So you know, can, you can do anything. Anything that's in the oven is bacon. Except I won't be selling chicken roasts <laughs> at my business because those aren't dandies. Dandies are sweet things. Um, is there such a thing as a healthy dandy, or is that? Yes, <laughs> actually, oatmeal and raisin cookies yes. with cinnamon in them sounds disgusting. It's disgusting. It sounds very good. They're delicious. Well, the cinnamon sounds good. Actually. I made them oatmeal and raisin, and everyone wants it. Oatmeal and raisin with cinnamon. But it hot butter in them? So how do you make them? A little tiny bit. Uh, oatmeal, raisin, milk, uh, cinnamon, and I, it said to use sugar, but I was making them for a diabetic friend, so I used candorel instead. Um, and okay, there was a tiny bit of butter, like like a teaspoon of butter, uh, and then just mix it together and roll it in your hands, get them disgusting, and then squash them, put them in the oven for kind of hours. 20 minutes at 200 degrees or something. I can't, can't remember everything exactly. I've got it all places. Books. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. There's a system. The recipes are somewhere. Is there ever any elevation baking or is it always just repeat the same thing over and over again? Well, you can repeat the same thing over and over again and you get the same result. Well, if, well, if you repeat it perfectly, you get the same result. It's precision ish. Um, <laughs> like engineering. Um, so you can do the same thing over and over again, you get the same thing out of it. 
Uh, as long as you do the knife check. Do you know the knife check? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everyone knows the knife check. Unless I don't know the knife check. You don't know the knife check. I don't bake. If you're baking something, if you're not sure if it's cooked or not, if it's brown on the outside and it's sitting there and it looks cooked, you get a knife, stick it in the middle, if it comes out dirty, then it's not baked. Okay. Except it doesn't work for bread. <laughs> Never work for bread because bread is too hard. You stick the knife in, you take it out, it'll always be clean because the dough just holds itself together so nothing comes out. But there's a check for bread as well. You just take it out, tap it in the bottom if it sounds hollow, it's cooked. Oh, yeah. And then you put it in upside down for five minutes to make sure the bottom's crispy. Um, will you be making bread? Hmm? Will you be making bread? I will be making bread. <laughs> and possibly oh. selling it with soup. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> yum, yum. Homemade soup! What kind of soup? Vegetable, probably. Because <laughs> that's the nicest with bread. <laughs> is, is that, that as, as in you'll probably be selling vegetable soup, or it will be oh, soup that okay. might be vegetable? <laughs> or there will it be like some horse, horse? Stuff, like <laughs> horse <laughs> stuff? It could be probably <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> I mean, I might buy them, and they might not be vegetables. And I might put them in thinking they're vegetables, and then I'll get And then bit. suddenly it's bacon. And then, <laughs> and then suddenly it's bacon. And suddenly it's maybe vegetable soup. It's a sort of risk you have to take um, when you come down these standees. You might get something you like, and you might get something that you like so much that you place an order for 24 and I get lots of money. Um, and when you be selling coffee to go with the cakes, or is that a step? That's a question I have to ask him. Because you can't sit and have a piece of cake. You can't have a piece of cake. What if, I, what if I sell you coffee at a discount? Because you love coffee. Oh no, I'm trying, I'm trying to cut that out. I'm coffee. <laughs> what if I sell like coffee? There are bars in the that are calling me and saying, please come back. <laughs> what if I make you a coffee cake? <gasps> With walnuts? With walnuts? I and think coffee? This, I think this is something that has to be tested several times. What about, what about coffee cake that doesn't have coffee in it, but is meant to be eaten with coffee? That's it's just what you exactly, but you have to drink coffee with it. <laughs> I think the short answer to that is we'll see. Um, Tanner's going up again. Does that mean I have another <laughs> seven minutes? No, <laughs> you can talk for forever. Yeah. Yes. Um, any more questions? Oh yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. First one. Well, we'll, we'll make it clear. What's the creation you're most proud of, and which of your creations do you think will be most profitable or popular? Okay. I know the answer to the second one already, which is my caramel cookies, because I made I hate you already. <laughs> I made I made twelve of them and I brought them in and set them down and then ten minutes later I had none of them. And I said I wanted one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I had no cookies left. And that I just means you need to make another batch. It does. Yeah. Or ten. And they'll all get sold. <laughs> Because they're 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 uh, they were sixty p each or two for a pound. Uh, Way too cheap. <laughs> I've I've heard other things, but well, from from, from my from my mother that they were like, oh, they're so expensive. And I was like, well, nobody was complaining. <laughs> um, but apparently they're delicious. I was sort of like, yeah, they're okay, and everyone else was like, make me more. But. Um, so those are the most profitable, I think. My proudest is a really sad thing. My own birthday cake. Because <laughs> that was the first time I made fondant dicing. And it turned out well, other than the bastard wouldn't get off the countertop. <laughs> it was too sticky. <laughs> That haunts my dreams. Um, there nothing worse than sticky bones. It wasn't even. It wasn't sticky whenever I put it on, though, which was even worse. It wasn't sticky until I rolled it, and then I was like, "No, I'm not coming off. Find another way to put me on your cake." So I had to make some sort of intricate system of pulleys and levers. <laughs> also known as baking paper. Um, I just roll it on that and then put it on. Baking paper is a wonderful invention. I don't know where I'd be today if I didn't have baking paper. Well, this wouldn't be here. Um, no, baking paper is fantastic. If you're making anything, make sure there's baking paper. Because it either makes everything delicious or easier to make or easier to clean or 
Uh, easier. Um, any more questions? There's something missing from your repertoire, which is bacon cupcakes. It's not, <laughs> because if you had been here earlier, you would have heard about the bacon scones. scones. I can't tell the difference whenever you say baking or bacon. Bacon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's baking with bacon. Or bacon baking. Bacon bacon. Bacon bacon. Um, any more questions? Yes. No, I, I just saw a question, I'd just like to say. Well done. You know, you're clearly very, very passionate about this and you have Sean Juan said in the talk there. If you're passionate about something, you'll sell yourself to come across very well. And you're obviously very, very passionate about baking. I think it's absolutely fantastic. So very well done. Yeah. Every day, next month. Next month. <laughs> <laughs> Legally, I'm not open yet. Um, on the note of passion, I am too passionate. I spent, how long did I spend baking one night? Was it 12 hours that day? 14, it was 14 hours spent baking one day, and bed was never so comfortable <laughs> that night. Um, but yeah, yeah, comfy bed. Uh, any other questions? Bed cake, bed cake, cake shaped like a bed, that would be a good thing for anyone who's tired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just torture them more. Look, this is like you've got great comic timing as well. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Really good stand up. Um, Would you consider TV chefing? <laughs> <laughs> One day! Internet. Uh, internet. <laughs> internet TV. I've, I've actually got a vaguely related question. Right, okay, for a variety of different reasons, maybe having a cafe in here would be a little bit difficult to run. But when are you going to start running courses? What, what, what? When are you going to start running baking courses? Courses? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Once I'm open, Italian bread. I'm actually trying to make, um, I don't even know what bread is. Or that one, the one with the, the, the one with the dimples and the oil and the things in the dimples. Um, that's 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 what, that's what. Well, it could be olives or, or tomatoes or rosemary or garlic or I actually make garlic bread as well from scratch, which is quite nice. It's just bread with garlic in it. <laughs> Courses, I'd probably have to get a license for that to make sure that people didn't cut their hands off or something. I'm not even using that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna, I don't take responsibility for any poisoning that you might do to people yeah. that you give to food to. I will just highlight that at the same time as we're developing the long desired idea of having this as being partially a baker space, at the same time we do have. A biohacking lab being developed in the back. <laughs> they, can make, they can make me more delicious flour. Oh, more I'm delicious like eggs. A cup of coffee that's got some penicillin on the top. <laughs> eggs, 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 <laughs> eggs without the chip. Self replicating eggs. It's <laughs> <laughs> very, very easy. You crack an egg. Out comes the yolk, so the white, no and another egg. egg. Chicken and the egg is just always an egg. It doesn't, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what, came, what, came, what came first, chicken or the egg? It doesn't matter, they're both in the kit. Am I rolling on too later? Should I keep going? <laughs> well, no, I was going to ask you to come back at the end. <laughs> if you want, just to close it up. Okay. I'm fun around to. Well, now that, now that you've eaten up my time, I can only keep it down to a three minute one. But no, uh, before I go on to my ridiculous rant, Andy. Oh, yeah. No pressure. Um, I actually was wondering who went to the effort of making me a nice poster. <laughs> I'm a cake seller. Right. No, I'm not. Um, uh, it's a bit weird being up here because uh, it wasn't really what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, I'm 
short history, it's going to be very hard to follow such a fantastic entertainment performance. Uh, but my name is Andy, or Andrea, if you want to go full length. Um, I'm doing my master's uh, at the moment here. Is, this is my research abroad part, by the way. I, I actually live in the Netherlands, but I'm not Dutch. I know the accent will tell you otherwise. But, uh, people often don't know that I'm Irish because I traveled quite a lot after university and I kind of realized that, how can I get from getting rid of her? <laughs> so, trick number one, tone down the accent. <laughs> and which really helped a lot with uh, meeting people from all around the world and a lot of other places. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out how to improve people's attitudes towards networking because I think this is the key to solving this problem between um, what I'm looking at is the SMEs, entrepreneurs, intermediary bodies or places where people can mix and the universities. It's a massive um, pool of knowledge. This, each corner has its own specific um, great aspects to it but there seems to be a lot of problem between linking all of it together. Um, basically, people on the ground level, why wouldn't you approach uh, a, a university for help with an idea? Why wouldn't you go to somewhere like Farset Labs and do something like this? Why wouldn't you ask an SME for their um, markets or their data or whatever to help you with uh, a project you have an idea on? It's basically, there's so many great ideas I've seen that come to nothing because people don't meet the right people. And a lot of it kind of boils down to not having an attitude of wanting to bother and just kind of sitting there and going, well, it didn't work out for me, blah, which is crap. <laughs> uh, because um, a lot of the young people I meet now, I'm, I'm really terrified of going into the graduate world because I don't know what kind of job I'm going to end up, even if I get one for a while. Um, but a lot of people kind of graduate going, well, where's my job? It's supposed to be handed to me. Here we are, here's my thing, here's what I need, where is it? And this happens in all kinds of walks of life that I've met, that people just expect people to understand what they need and give it to them. Or somebody, somewhere, some institution just goes, there you are. Instead of developing an attitude of, why don't I go and sort that out myself? Now you don't have to start anywhere ridiculously big, to you know, it, keep it simple. I solved this by putting myself in situations that I found terrifying and challenging and risky and okay, it suits me, I don't have like kids or you know, I, I, things like that that would maybe tie me down, so I was terrified of speaking in front of people, terrified. At this point I would be on the floor hyperventilating and that, that, that actually is what happened, but, but clearly I've gotten better at that. Uh, what did I do? I offered to uh, read at mass. That's how it started when I was 14. I offered to do the readings at mass. And <laughs> then on, it was an attitude of, well, I need something or someone to push me to get to where I want to be. So in order to do so, I would spontaneously like sign up for something and then go, oh crap, I promised I'd do that. I'll just, I'll just have to do it and each time learning. This is how, what started me traveling. I've lived, uh, I'm 25 now, and I've lived in, on my own book and dollar, in Malta and in Spain and in Qatar, and now I live in the Netherlands. And I've never been to Northern Ireland until two weeks ago, <laughs> funnily enough, even though I just come from Clare. And each one, most people go to Australia, yay, and live with the same exact same people there than they would back here. And this is a terrible way of trying to learn something new. And what I mean by learning something new is everyone has their speciality, their job. You're a techie techie nerd, which is kind of most of my friends, and they have all these amazing ideas and then it just gets stuck there, not all the time, but most of the time. Or you're in fashion, or you're in whatever the hell you do. What is so horrible about going to an event like this held by <coughs> an industry that you don't have a clue about, that you know nothing about. Why not once in a while, could be once a month, could be once every two months, just go to something else with people you don't know and just sit there and listen to them. You don't have to say anything if you don't want to, just sit there and listen to them. The point being that um, it is scientifically proven, for sure, the more 
random knowledge that you learn, the smarter you are at assimilating and putting together in different ways the knowledge you already have. It's that simple. If you only stay within your speciality, you'll never learn to uh, uh, melt it together into other kind of weird options because it won't occur to you. It simply won't occur to you. You could be incredibly smart at what you do, but just for example, the guy who did Polaroid. Now he had developed a kind of light polarizing system that was used for car lights and for sunglasses and that was making just a very ordinary business profit. And then one day his three-year-old daughter said to him, why can't I see my picture straight away? And thus the Polaroid camera was born. Just because he listened to some someone who has nothing to do with anything he did. And it's very easy to only talk to your peers, to only talk to people within your office, or within your own company, or within your own academic study. And I know this. So I often just get the hell out of there and I do something weird like end up in Farset Labs in Belfast for whatever reasons. And I'm meeting all kinds of amazingly different uh, people that I'm going to include all the stories I've heard into research. That's the whole point being to get little businesses like Andy's a chance, a realistic chance of getting a little bit of cash to get a bakery someday based on real evidence from basically good ideas that finally look realistic and that you can communicate to people outside of your bubble, if that makes sense. Anyways, seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. Questions? <laughs> God, I hope it makes sense. Is this lobbying people to do it? Or is it trying to find ways to do it better? Or what's the goal of what you're doing, I guess? Well, it's not clear where it's going to end up, I suppose, but I'd like I personally would like people to be more adept at risk taking, and I don't mean risk taking as in financial risk taking. I mean take a personal risk and stepping outside of your own area of comfort is something that everyone can benefit from. It will, it does make you better at learning. And if you want to come up with novel ideas or innovation, as he will rant about, this is the it's free and easy way to do so. And I, I, I mean, in general, I'm just interested in people doing well from their ideas. And yeah, I, I want to, I guess, build up evidence that could maybe influence policy to make a more realistic financial programs available to small businesses because there's a huge uh, mistrust. Like if you want to get uh, a loan, you have to prove you can pay the loan. Which kind of defeats the purpose of needing a loan most of the time. And if, well, if you don't pay it back, it's not a loan, it's a gift. That's true, but I mean. Um, Until they take the parcel away. <laughs> that is true. I mean, I know that I, I realise the practical side, but like. Um, I think we could afford to be a bit more trustworthy, but I, I think a lot of people haven't. They don't know a lot about the marketing side or the business side. Very few people can get well educated in both selling a service or product and creating a service or product. I mean, how are you ever going to be an expert in both? And the relation between them really needs to improve and trying to find out ways of, of uh, increasing trust, basically not having this whole like paranoia, which the crisis really has created, to allow realistic looking prospects to happen. Not just here have a 200% bank loan for a house when you're on a teacher salary. I mean, that's, that's really ridiculous. But it could be, it, it's just gone, it's swung too far the other way. That's all. And I think if you just get people's thinking, we'll change things. It really does. Most people get cynical about that. Yeah, it's good. It's sort of colorful. So like, I academia, I've got a thing, I've said intensely. So you're, you're saying I should like go out and to prove to say marketing of this thing. Except in my experience of marketing people, they're all tool bags. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, funnily enough, they think you're a tool bag as well. well I'm sorry, how dare I be intelligent? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they think you're a tool bag. They're both, I mean, it, it's like. Then how do you improve this relationship with everyone? Yeah. Okay, so well, they don't all hate each other, but a lot of it is just like not even uh, not even trying to understand. For example, uh, something um, 
that that robot he thinks I will have a basic knowledge of. But um, it's kind of intimidating sometimes, like PhD level. Oh my god, like, big scary smart guy. Um, if you just present yourself as an ordinary guy, you know, as something like this, I would never normally uh, have even thought of speaking out because I felt quite intimidated. I, I thought it was going to be either all like high level techies or I mean, there's a lot of professionals. I'm like, who am I? <laughs> But why the hell not? I mean, the, the, if, if you were to go to one of these, um, there's actually right now this evening, there's a kind of marketing y, sales y group of people doing a get together drinks, the JCI, Junior Chamber thing. I have no idea. Yeah, did you, ever, did you even think of looking it up to see? Well, how or where is it? It's on the bright like this is. No, I got this because I got an email in my inbox. From, <laughs> from, from who? Yeah. Right. And yeah, I mean, because you happen to be here, because you went looking for a place like this to work in at some point or to practice in. I mean, how, when you think about how did you end up here? I mean, how could this? All my friends are here. <laughs> okay, so this is like accident that I'm in this building. So this is like going to Australia, really, is it? Yes. <laughs> it's 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 network locking. I mean, well, that's what I'm sort of specific how do you, like, how do you what are you what are you researching in layman's terms? Like, what are you um, doing? Where what's it? What's it? GPS for indoors. Where people are. GPS for indoors. Yeah, this GPS is not one inside. So if you couldn't be a good enough stalker already, you could be now. Okay, so a GPS indoors, and why would this be useful? Well, it's useful for a whole bunch of wide applications. Um, one of the ones that we quite like is a uh, patient and doctor analysis. So if somebody's in a hospital and wired up to uh, heart rate monitor and suddenly have a heart attack, not only do you know that this has happened, you know where they are, and then you can page the nearest doctor or staff when and say, you're really close, get to the right time, and they will know immediately where they're going. And you can also do other more mundane things like making sure the doctors are doing their eyes, where the patients are, and yeah. making sure you've got the right patients in the operating room, kind of thing. Okay. Um, I, I was at a, a showcase two weeks ago here, and there's a small company called IntelliSense that has made a, a wireless version of this for all people. Mm, it's, it's actually it's a big deal at the minute because it's the yes. that just become cheap and small enough that you can try and like fit into anybody. All right. So this, I mean, outside of the health system, like there's so many other ways this could be used. But how would you know that unless you just talk to randomers about your idea? They could come up with this little like light bulb idea. Like that's why I gave the example of the pool right guy. He just he was just with his daughter and three. She just goes, I want to see my picture, and he goes like, and it made him a multimillionaire. I'm not saying it's all about money. I'm saying her input changed everything because she was completely removed from his work, had nothing to do with it, and he, he just took the time to, to listen to her. And, you know, it, there's so many little bits like this. This is what, if you just stick with the same guys and you know everything yeah. about your research, where are you going to get a fresh idea? Oh, well, I guess I'm trying to, it's, it's good advice, but it's very broad is the problem, yes. I think. It's, yeah, it's I know. That. I think we're, we're <laughs> asking, where do you start? How, yes. how do you yeah. look at something exactly. that you don't know about? Yeah, well, first of all, Assume that everyone knows something useful to you. Ev everyone anywhere knows something. You yeah. can't, you know, you should always assume that they've got something. Yeah, that's how I found out about this place was beating another guy. Perfect, perfect example. Place. I mean, this, this is how it is. Uh, the problem is when you don't bother searching. What I'm saying is once a month, like for one evening, every time <coughs> again. There are times when you get stuck in your research or in your, your methods of work and you just wonder, like, how, how could I possibly improve this? Throw yourself for a couple of hours into a group of complete strangers who are not in your line of work and see what happens. The worst that will happen is nothing changes. There will be a few hours of your time, so what? I mean, it's, it's not but like... Maybe nothing changes for William, but something might change for them. Also, so the and you share your... Because yeah, I don't think about yeah, what you do, but it's really, really interesting to hear about new ideas. That's why I love coming here, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a, you know, it's a two-way street as well. And I think it's really interesting for other people in Northern Ireland to know about what's going on in Tech Queens and in the Science Park mm -hmm. and in kind of tech world because I mean, what you guys are all working on is very, very rarely discussed, you know? It's, it's very rarely yeah, discussed, discussed outside of the closed door. That's yeah, what I mean. And, and it's really you know, there's, there's, yeah. Cause there's so many great things happening. There are but that's actually part of the things. problem, is that um, the, the 
because there's so much happening in so many diverse different areas, the only logistical way that you can manage anything, any of these associate organizations or anything like that, is to work on some kind of subject area focus, which effectively then becomes a self-reinforcing problem where, okay, you might want to be improving. Uh, one of the uh, regimes that's come in through uh, ACIT is that, you know, research within ACIT, you have sessions where you're sharing research. That's just techies talking to more techies about techie stuff. It might be different techie stuff. Mm. But it's well, not too far away from what you've already learned. For example, yeah. I, I'm teaching myself Dutch. And this means I go to, because I'm doing it for free, because I don't have time, I have time for money for glasses. I go to these free like meetup exchange languages and I've met such absolutely random people that have ended up influencing what I'm doing for my thesis and brought me in a long way around Belfast to do so. So, I mean, I mean, it's changed a lot for me just by sitting and talking to them. Not as well as slightly improving my Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so it's random free language. Uh, where do you find There's lots of free... Uh, if you spend enough time on the internet, you'll find free teaching on almost anything. And okay. I'm busy teaching myself Mandarin Chinese, but I would love to do it with a group of people. But again, I can't afford to. Uh, yeah, course. either you know you can't really make it to the same time at the same place all the time, or it's money. Yeah. And there's, um, well, I can just like talk with you afterwards instead and give you better <laughs> links to that. Does, is there any other like general question? I mean, there is What's value. What's the fix? Hmm? What's the solution? The solution. Well, as I said, I mean, oops, that's sweet. <coughs> Take that little risk and get out of your comfort zone. I mean, maybe you don't want to learn Mandarin or learn Dutch or you don't want to do exercise. But there, I've already seen like there's a bunch of hill walking groups here. Mm -hmm. Go really for a walk. Yeah, it's really good. It is a really good. One. I mean, it's just something like that. Uh, and when you're there, what's on? When you're there, just 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 ask yeah, someone. Awesome. Can I yeah. just say, like, excuse me? Can, can I just bounce an idea off you and, and just tell me what you think and just see what happens. I've been wandering around here just saying what I'm doing. And I'm hearing lots of really interesting suggestions. It even gets you to just reflect on your own research in, an, in their own way. Maybe they'll tell you absolute bullshit, but maybe it'll think, make you think in a different way. And it's, it costs you, like I said, a few hours of your time. And if you just start this attitude of trying to keep learning, trying to see other angles all the time, it becomes habit and it, it, all it can do is good. Except when it comes to writing up your dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to just not think about that. Either. I'm going to oh, pay yeah. someone in Pakistan to write it. Bangladesh. <laughs> right, thanks very much. Right, since we're getting a little bit short for time, I'm going to be awkward and modify, the, modify my own thing. Um, so this was pitched as being an innovation run, but I would heavily encourage people to jump in at whatever point they feel necessary to make any counter or proof point that they believe is vaguely relevant at the time. Some of you in the room may know that I have a big problem with the word innovation. I think it's the worst possible word that you could use, but at the same time, it's one of the most overused words that we've got in specifically Northern Ireland, but the UK and you know, Western Europe at the minute, because it's innovation. It's an innovative process. It's an innovative process that changes the way that we're looking at everything. Okay, but what the fuck does that mean? I mean, it's, it, whenever you look at it, innovation is a combination of two Latin words, into, new. That's it. Nothing complicated, it's just something new. Um, I was reading up on Wikipedia, The Fountain of All Knowledge, um, which uh, uh, and, and presented two interesting comparisons, which I had to actually jot down so that I get them the right way around. But innovation is not improvement because innovation implies being different rather than just being better. And innovation is not invention because innovation is the use of an idea rather than the creation of an idea. Right? Those two things 
don't sell the word innovation to me as being something that the government and the private are, and the and the private sector are forcing down everyone's throats as being the solution to all of life's problems. It's okay. Your process is shit, but if you make it innovative, it'll be brilliant. That's not how the real world works. Right? Uh, uh, does anyone have any right, really pristine examples? Because I know I've got mine, and uh, for a variety of political reasons, I'm not going to do it. But uh, where innovation really sucks for you personally in your work or recreational life. Anytime that you've been kicked around because, oh, you've been sent to this innovation seminar and it just was a waste of time. Am I the only one with this problem? Or is it. Is, is, uh, right. So. Really? Oh, no, you're right. You're not on PRDP, are you? <laughs> <laughs> but no, my personal viewpoint on this is. A, fairly clear already, and B, uh, tying all of these... Oh, hang on, uh, come on. Go for it. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it. Why not? This guy's... Well... If the, it's really that bad, I can censor it later. A, because you'll, well, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's an organisation here that's supposed to be promoting the cloud. Uh. They've got lots of cloud <laughs> and, uh, they, 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 um, they, 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 they have a name that's similar, but not completely the same as Whisper. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> And I'm like, right, for, <laughs> they were giving a little talk on a new media kind of, um, <laughs> well, okay, they were giving the talk at E3, <laughs> the Belfast, <laughs> Mel, I'm actually said, Belfast Mel place, and I was told, oh, we're just keeping the numbers limited on this, so I got a very prestigious invite to it. I mean, I'm, I don't even need to know about the client, it's just me and my business. But um, anyway, and I know a better one, but so this organisation has been given how much money? Three million? I think million, the official million. term is a metric shit ton. Yeah, um, <laughs> to, I don't know, educate the old man, educate the old the cloud. I have not seen or heard what they've done. I mean, there's an interesting point on that actually that um, I was at the launch event for their um, study into how cloud is going to make everything better but it was the only thing that they had at the, at the event was the um, brief so <coughs> eight pages maybe ish all very glossy and all very well designed and, and well and the graphs didn't have any numbers on them and you know uh, all of those all of those all those good feel good you know uh, what do you call them the the uh, sort of manager summaries or executive summaries exactly it was an executive summary that was a year ago and I still can't lay my hands on the full report so. No one knows what they've done with all the money. Oh no, no, I know exactly where it went. It went to venue fees and, well, other redistributions as well. But that's fine. It's not all about the money. My, I mean, yes, obviously, because of this place and the fact that we fall into what was the fantastic phrase you had for the structural gap? Structural hole. Structural hole. We fall into a fantastic structural hole, which means because we're not a profit making enterprise, we can't really do anything with Invest and I because they don't want us. Um, we can't do anything with the Arts Council because we're not hardy enough. Um, we are too small for the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, although I'm arguing with that at the, end of the minute. Um, and there's a, a many, many three letter acronyms that basically summarizes being because we are a groundswell, because this is a case of a community that fell together and basically said, what about me? Right, okay, we're hearing seven figure sums going to a variety of different projects that are all doing stuff. And there's what, a nine million earmark for an innovation center. Um, and everyone was kind of left wondering, right, what about me? And then what about me was asked several times. And then eventually we turned around and said, fuck it, we'll do it ourselves. So now. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. No, it's not. It's simpler than that. It's far simpler than that. It's just fucking doing it. This is this actually it dovetails quite nicely out of what you're talking about. Because That's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's just fucking do it. It's you know, it, it's 
we got off our horses and did something and threw something together. Now, the funny thing is that this has all now come full circle, and we are being called up as being one of these exemplars of innovation. <laughs> um, so, uh, over the past two weeks, I've discovered that I've been invited to speak at three different events about innovation. So, this <laughs> is a preview. Um, I discovered that. Uh, yeah, I, I discovered that I was um, positioned just before the the close of the conference. So I've basically got the final word on innovation. <laughs> Not sure where that's going to go down. But yeah, I mean, there's there's such a wealth of frustration, and yes, I'm I'm the vocal, honest one who goes out and says it first. But I've heard it from uh, you know back of the pub conversations, in the street conversations, at the conference, wondering, or sitting in the coffee line conversations of, shit, is this another fucking innovation conference? Is, it, is, <laughs> is, is this going to be another innovation solution? Is it, and it, even worse is whenever you're talking to people who are higher up and they're going, is it an innovative solution? Is it an innovative project? And it's just, no, it's not. It's just a project that does good and keeps the world going right. This isn't something that's specific to Farset. The Farset's one angle. This is something that I really believe applies to everything that people do. And having this term, I mean, one of the most um, common applications of the word innovation to what's being done with people is process innovation and innovating your business practices and things like that. That's just tidying up your procedural bullshit. That's, it's not being innovative, it's tidying up and streamlining. Streamlining is another one of those words that was a horrible buzzword for a few years, back in a bit, and now innovation seems to have replaced it. And for the first time in my life, I'm looking backwards at the old buzzword and going, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> Have that one back, please. But yes, that's my rant, and um, I feel fantastic. <laughs> so, um, if anyone has any questions or queries or wants to argue with me over anything in particular, please feel free. I and they. need to add work, you need to invent a word. But then and that's just even worse. <laughs> it's, 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 um, I, I think it's quite nice that the, the Plain English campaign is something that I keep trying to tell myself to use more often, but unfortunately I basically had a dictionary shoved down my throat whenever I was a child. Um, but. It's not innovative. It's it, it make it innovative is too general a word. It it just means new. Uh, the other translation is just uh, change or to renew. It's uh, there there. I don't think there's any need for creating another word because I think it's something that innovation as a word was nearly created to fill a linguistic gap between actually describing what you're doing. I mean, it, it was, it, it's like uh, uh, the programmers in here will, will know the term wildcard and, well, and poker players. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's a wildcard phrase that basically says, we're doing good stuff, give us money. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure what the solution is. I don't even think there is a case of there being a solution, but uh, I think it's a case where innovation is something that, or a word that I think should be used a lot more sparingly than it is at the minute. I'm not going to live that long. What's <laughs> 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 called addiction of terms? <laughs> they always put in the phrases of uh, words. Exactly. Well, um, yeah, but the only way that you can, the only way that you can overturn a soundbite is by replacing it with an even worse one. Um, so, by worse for some definitions of worse. So you you can't. Until you can cut down an idea to a few syllables that they can turn into a sound bite, I think that's 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 a lossy compression scheme. It's it's something that loses the meaning of what you're actually trying to describe. So um, someone could easily turn around and say, "Farce is an innovation center." No, it's not. Far more complicated than that. We we don't do innovation. We do we do baking and we do electronics and we do and we do three D printing and we do pinball and we do quadcopters and we do beer and pizza nights and we do movie nights and we do networking events and we do presentations. We don't do innovation. We do all this other stuff that actually produces shit. So yeah, Andy, you get a word in. Sorry. Uh, how are you going to prevent what I was saying that happens that just the same circle of people end up and it doesn't get mixed up like it should? 
I don't know is the short answer. And I really hope that you feed back with us and tell us right how. Yeah, sure, you can have a coffee. <laughs> See if it comes up with anything great. Because it's it's a terrible problem that um, I don't know whether it's specific to Northern Ireland because I I, I, I used to think it was specific to Northern Ireland, but as I travelled around, I sort of found yeah, it's 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 the same same groups. Yeah. Um and. One, I, I, some of the older parts of people will probably remember that we used to have some fantastic conversations about right we'll, we'll be able to get in the artists and we'll bring in the musicians and we'll bring in the sculptors and we'll bring in the writers and we'll bring in the we'll, 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 we'll bring in the managers and we'll bring in the marketers and we'll bring in everybody and it'll be a, a vibrant community of everyone exchanging ideas but those people are difficult to talk to because they're not in your automatic social group it's it's uh, the only reason why this place stands at all and why I think an awful lot of these uh, this sort of self-enclosing social aspects arise is because of those direct person-to-person -person social links. Um, I, I was saying to Annie earlier, but just in general, one of the m biggest weights off my mind in terms of the development of this place was about two months ago whenever I walked into the space and, and somebody asked me if I was a member. <laughs> and it was brilliant because it, it meant that it was getting beyond the second order network and it meant that it was it was attracting people who I had never met and never spoken to and that David had never met and never spoken to and Owen had never met and never spoken to and it was, it was beyond um, uh, and it was just fantastic and then around about the same time I'd come to the realisation that I don't know everything that's going on in here anymore I only discovered about Andy's Dandies day before yesterday something like that I think it was yesterday yeah something like that and, and it's just uh, there, there's uh, uh, that's brilliant. Whenever it gets to the point where some a uh, place like this is big enough that um, you don't even know what's going on, that means that you're more likely to be just hit, running into people. There's enough uh, sort of temporal density in the place that people are coming through, and that you're more likely to mix with different people. This is why I love events like this. This is this, this is my be beyond everything else. My favourite event that uh, Farset runs is the Gathering Lightning series, and Frankly, I wish we had four or five times the capacity and three times the amount of speakers, but you know, there's only so much time in the world and you know, wish we could do everything. But I really think that, I think that this kind of event series answers the questions that your research is doing. But our problem is that we've kind of got stuck as well. Uh, we're working on it. We're not giving up yet, but we're a little bit stuck. Yeah. Can I, can I yes? Talk? Take it on a completely different, you know, tangent. Yes. Um, have you ever seen the film Witness? Yes. Um, in the film Witness, it's about the Amish community in uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So um, this guy's living in the middle of the Amish community, and he's trying to understand how it is that these people can be so different from the rest of the United States. Like these people are are going around in horse-drawn buggies. All this and. I don't know whether he explains it or whether it was my experience of being in Lancaster County and actually seeing the way the social network works. But the reason why the Amish are able to be so different is because they have a, a shell around them of Mennonites, mm. of, of other people who are halfway there. That they are the sort of they're kind of like a filter or like a buffer, uh, who actually mean that, that the, the Amish aren't face to face up against this harsh world. I mean, it's, you know, the, the interface is hard enough as, as witness shows. But, um, and, I mean, somebody's going to write a good article, but here's the title of the article. It's going to be called Sets in the City. Uh, but it's going to talk <laughs> about the different little groups all around this city who all have their own identity and would say, we'd love to get together with these other people, but they're so different from me. Bing. Funnily enough, that's not the problem. We, um, it's every time that we put Group A in a room with Group B, it's usually worked. But it's getting bums on seats and feet on the ground, and you know, um, this, this is one of these things where it's terrible and it's preaching to the choir. So it's not even like I'm going to convince anybody to do anything different because you're already doing something different by the sheer act of being here. But it is exactly as Andy says. We're just getting people to do something different is surprisingly difficult. It's so safe inside their little bubble. I mean, I, 
I've been exactly the same in the past. I've broke out of it a few times, but still. Um, and that that bubble breaking is very very difficult. Um, and what's what's quite interesting, bringing it back to the whole innovation run, is that one of the angles that people seem to be putting together as being a solution to this is to have these hubs or you know, knowledge transfer networks or whatever they're calling them this time around. Um, and they're a good idea, but what they seem to be designed for is sending information from the groups to the hub and then from the hub to the groups, which ends up with at least three layers of filtering. Whereas what you should be doing is just throwing throwing group A in the room with group B, locking the door, coming back four hours later and asking them for a, for a pitch. I mean, I think that that's the way that it should be done, but I'm not sure how, that, how scalable that is. So I'm tr trying, to develop, trying to develop this idea. I think what, what you need, or what you need, we need to be more appreciative of are the, the ones in the middle, these, these men, like, these, these people who, I mean, that's where I see myself, mm -hmm. essentially, is, as somebody who can go to the digital marketeers one night and go to you guys the other night and, you know, not think, I'm in a room with two books, I'm in a room with, you know, <laughs> not, <laughs> 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 I, this is, I, I'm going to give you some history. I, uh, I worked for the BBC for 31 years as an engineer, uh, and, but I worked alongside journalists, and engineers and journalists, it's a wonderful combination. I mean, there's an innovative thing for you. Mm. Getting a, an engineer to be a journalist, you're an animal. Um, but I am never putting a spanner in Lyra McKee's hand. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the guy, there's a guy called um, Kevin Kelly, who has the unenviable task of trying to control Stephen Nolan. But um, gravitationally, or <laughs> his output, his words. Staying away from the lawyers. Um, and the kids. And the kids. <laughs> yeah. I'll just but, stand over here. But Kevin, Kevin had a great line for me. Uh, at one point, he says, Well, this, don't give me all that pointy headed crap. Just make it work. <laughs> so I dedicated my life to being somebody who doesn't give journalists the pointy headed crap. Just make it work. That's it. Not knowing your feelings towards um, Steve Jobs, what have you as he's an exceptional breaks the room for your argument? I've actually, uh, in principle, I've got no problem with Steve Jobs in terms of his career. I just think he was a dick. Nobody knows he was. But people think he's good. No, but this is the thing: is that he did fantastic things. He, he uh, I mean, the funny thing was that again, sorry, we had this conversation earlier, so we, it was a fairly long one. The conversation was almost my preamble for this. But Steve Jobs uh, was one of the examples that I put as being the misuse of the original meaning of the word hacker. So Steve Jobs would have considered himself a hacker in the early days. And I think that saying that he's the exception that breaks the mold um, doesn't really work since he was almost part of the mold. If that makes sense. Well, he was never a hacker. N n uh, yeah, but in which definition? Well, I <clears throat> no, see, this is the problem. Uh, a hacker goes back to the, the, the self-described sort of uh, freaks, geeks, and weirdos. So the techie guys who were working with the very earliest days of computing and with the very earliest days of electrically switched telephony, uh, even the telegraph guys before that, uh, it would have been around about the sort of telephony stage where uh, they started describing themselves as being hackers, um, as people who you know hacked away at things to see how they worked and to see what they could do with them afterwards. It was only really until about the, the, the mid to late seventies, uh, no, late seventies, early eighties, and I think the the I think it was Kevin Mendick's fault um, that uh, basically whenever he brought hacking, uh, uh, hacking for hacking for personal or financial gain, i.e., uh, cracking, um, brought that to the media's attention. But the media then just went, "Oh, right, this is a nice word that looked vaguely relevant. Hacker! Yay! Everyone's a hacker!" Um, so the technical community has been quietly pissed off about this for about forty years. Um, but yeah, I, I can't remember where I was heading with that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it, it's a rant. But yeah. Uh, no, 
Nobody was. And even even if you take away the technical aspects of hacker, he is still a hacker. Well, yeah. not anymore. It was a hacker because he was looking at how people. Uh, the greatest gift that Steve, God, Steve Jobs ever gave was the art of usability and people actually giving a shit about usability. That was a case of him looking at something that was already existing, and specifically the Xerox Park machines, and <laughs> copying or adapting or innovating off of um, uh, a, yeah, existing, existing <laughs> systems, but taking the elements apart, working out what bits actually needed to be there and where they needed to be. Just because he didn't have a soldering iron in his hand or didn't spend his life in front of a computer terminal tapping away at code, doesn't mean that he wasn't a hacker. I think it actually almost makes it more impressive that he was as much of a hacker than he was that he wasn't that technical side of things. It's one of the reasons why we tried very, very hard to get in, or we've been slowly trying to get in the arts and musicians and things like that, because we really, really, truly believe that everyone's a hacker. They just don't know it yet. Uh, it's just a case of them give, being given a chance. I'm really interested to see what happens with those interfaces, because throwing people out of their comfort zone is fun. It's basically like sort of throwing somebody out of a train, but knowing that there's a lake there, sure don't. Um, so <laughs> nobody, no, never thought. Um, but yeah, so I, I think those interfaces are where the magic happens. But it's how to make those interfaces almost pervasive, so they're not interfaces anymore. It's just people talking to people. So yeah, um, innovation sucks. People should talk more. <laughs> <laughs> that was massively over time. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> That was a lot of fun. Um, there's still beer, so uh, you know we, we want to make sure that uh, BCS gets the money's worth. So um, everyone, uh, give force a beer into Phil's hand, um, and then that'll make things very, very interesting. But you're free to hang around. We've got plenty of toys around to play with and experiment with, and you know, feel free. It, it's people don't often get a chance to get down here because it's. Uh, it can be understandably intimidating to walk into this kind of environment. So take the opportunity, work out that this place is not nearly as intimidating as people think it is, and you know, feel free to poke around. All right, thanks very much, everyone. Um, what's your name?